Hello, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do, it's Gemma Zoe Smith here. I am this evening going to be doing a English mock paper walkthrough. And I know there's a couple of people in the group who want to join me live. So I am just going to sit here for a moment or so, just check that all of the tech is working. And um, then what we'll be doing is we'll be continuing and we will be starting with our live. So I'm just looking off to the side because I have another screen here and I'm just making sure that everybody can see me and hopefully everybody can hear me too. So I am there, I can see it, I can see that I'm live. Perfect, there we are. Brilliant and I think hopefully people are starting to join. So hello, welcome if you are joining. Uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes and we're going to begin with our English mock paper walk through hello hello people please do tell me as you join uh stick a stick a note in the comments um so that i can see you so that i know that you're here and um, and as i said we'll be beginning in a few minutes uh just once everybody has had a chance to find us to see where we are and um hopefully you would have seen that there is the text is in the um is in the group but if you haven't don't worry that's absolutely fine i have the text here for us to look through. Now, what we're going to be doing this evening is we are going to be going through a paper, it's a past paper, and um, I'm gonna be talking through how I would solve it and some tips and some tricks to help you to uh, to solve, hello, hi Annabelle, and to help you to solve uh, the paper this evening. Perfect. So we've got a couple of people seeing us live. I know that there are some people who said that they would join it um, afterwards. They'll watch the replay. Um, so hello, hello, Hanasheen. Hopefully I can pronounce that correctly. Um, brilliant. So um, I will be beginning with our text. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple of moments just to read through. And it's, it's not a, a, a particularly long text. I've chosen a text that is fairly complex though um so there are some tricky words in it there are there's some words that even i had to look up um so it's it's worth noting that even tutors have to have to really read these texts and really understand them and actually there's even a question that i had to ask someone else about so um i made sure that that my answer was making sense before i went live so, uh, oh, perfect. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to see you all joining in. Uh, I will be asking you all to add comments and to add what you think the answers are to these questions a little bit later on. So let's crack on and um, let's start with the text. And I'll move this through to the text. Hopefully you can see. Let's pop this on a uh, full slide. So let's have a look. Where's the present pop? Here it is. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see that for me and um, you can have a quick read. Have a quick read if you've not already had a look through this passage. If you have looked through the passage, let me know in the comments. Let me know that you've already read it. Um, I'll give us a couple of minutes just to have a skim read through. And you'll see, as I did when I read through it, that there's a lot of tricky words in there. There's lots and lots of words that are quite tricky for us and, um, and it makes it sometimes hard to understand. So whilst you're reading through, I'll be talking about some of the things that I do on the first reading, what I teach. So for me, when I'm having a look through this passage, if it's in front of me, I might be underlining some words. And you'll see there that there are some words that are underlined. I might be also drawing a picture of each kind of bit of the paragraph and sometimes that helps me to remember oh this is the bit where they mention this or this is the bit where this happens so just drawing my drawings aren't great they're little stick figures um but it helps me to remember to understand and to process that passage the other thing that i'm doing as i go through the text is i'm starting to think about what is it that the questions might be asking so some of you who, uh, who've read it, are oh, perfect, Deepal, I can see that you have read it. Um, you might have started to consider what are the questions that I might end up getting asked and, um, and, and how might I be answering them? 
So we know immediately because of the fact that there's lots of unusual words in here that we're probably looking at some, some uh, word questions, looking at what they mean. We know that we're going to be looking at some inference. We know we've got to be reading into that text and really, really searching for those answers, putting ourselves in the shoes of the people in the text. And we know that there's some speech. We know that there is... Uh, there's there's kind of a story that's going on. We can think about characters. So we've got lots to consider as we read through this text. So uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes more just to have a look through that text. And um, don't worry if you don't get the whole way through it. This live is going to be saved on the group and you will be able to access it um, afterwards. So so you can um, you can you can go back and you can have a look at what. To slow it down and, and, and read through the answers. But we're going to give a couple of minutes just to have a look through um, and let everybody else join us who might need to. Hello, Harriet, um, who's joined us recently. We're just reading through this text. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a text from Dickens. It's a Charles Dickens um, text that we're looking at. Um, make sure you read the bit in italics because that bit tells us all about what the text is about. And, um, and and to have a read through for me. So uh, if you can't see the text on the um, on the slides, then um, then this, the text is also in the group. I added it to the group earlier so that you guys could see it. Um, it is it is there. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a minute longer. Just have a read through and just have a look. And then we'll be moving on to the questions. So there is quite a lot, as I said, it's quite a lot of tricky language. We've underlined quite a bit of it. Um, and those are some of the things that will be coming up in the question. There's some old language as well in this text. We know that the writer is describing England in 1775. So we expect the language is going to be quite complex. And I've chosen this because it is quite a complex text. So it is there to really challenge you guys and to see how much you can manage to work out. Hi, Gia. Thanks for joining us. Okay, we're going to be moving on in 30 seconds. Okay, so hopefully you've had a look through the passage. But even if you haven't got all the way to the end, don't worry, because I'm going to be talking you through how I would answer these questions and how I would teach you guys to answer these questions too. Because it's not just about reading the text, it's also about understanding the questions and having the tips and the technique to be able to go in and look at the text and see what's happening. Hi, Pranshi. It's great for you to join us. Thank you for joining us. Okay. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to move on to the next slide. And the next slide has a load of questions, but we're going to take each question as it is, and then I'm going to explain over the answer. So here is our first set of questions. We're going to be just looking at question one. Just for the moment, we're looking at question one. And it says, which statement best describes the picture of England given in the first paragraph? Now, that one's really clear because it tells you you're only looking at the first paragraph. We can ignore all the rest. Which statement best describes the picture of England given in the first paragraph? And it's a multiple choice paper because lots of you will be taking grammar school entrance. And so that's why we've chosen a multiple choice. So it says, A, people boasted of how they were not afraid of the violent robberies. B, violent robberies were frequent and people were afraid. C, people wore disguises, so their bravery was not recognized. 
And D, people boasted of how good their disguises were. So we've got four different options here. And what I'm going to do is consider how would I look to answer this? Well, the first thing that I'm doing is I need to go back and read through that first paragraph. So I can see here that there are certain things that are mentioned in the question. So we can see that families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town without removing their furniture. We know that the mail was waylaid by seven robbers. We know that there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Now, that's a tricky sentence. So we've got to try and work out what scarcely means and what justify means. And then the bit at the bottom, the bit that says nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. So I'm going to go back to the question. Just here. And we've got A, people boasted of how they were not afraid of the violent robberies. B, violent robberies were frequent and people were not afraid. C, people wore disguises so their bravery was not recognised. And D, people boasted of how good their disguises were. So if you'd like to take part, please in the comments add down what letter do you think is the right answer? So do you think it is A, do you think it's B, C or D? So give that one a go for me. What do you think it is? A, B, C or D? Okay, so we've got a guess coming in or an answer coming in. Perfect. So a couple of you thinking B, B, B. Perfect. Good. Okay, someone who's not too sure, that's perfectly fine. Multiple choice, we always make sure we give an answer. So you definitely put down what you think. Brilliant. Okay. So like all of you guys, I would agree that the answer here is B. And really what we're using in terms of skills is our summary skills. We're going back through and we're seeing, right, which ones of these are correct? Which ones of these are most correct? So there's a bit about where people say that they do boast, but that's right at the top. There was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. So that says there's scarcely, there's not very much order and protection, and it doesn't justify, it doesn't um, give rise to, it's not, not the reason that we should be boasting, because there's not much order and protection. So people aren't boasting about how they're being afraid of violent robberies. In fact, they're being told to move their furniture. They're being told to watch out. And then the bit about disguises, there isn't much about disguising in there, um, but we are talking about the end part. Nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. We are talking about how these are being, these people are being warned about the, uh, the, the violent robberies that are happening. So we are going for why the violent robberies were frequent and people were not afraid. Okay. This is still in the same first paragraph and we're looking at where did most of the robberies occur? So we've got A, which is in Turnham Green, B, outside London, C, in London, and D, in St. Giles's Church. So again, I'm going to give you the passage and we're looking only at the first paragraph at this point. And the problem with this is that lots of those words, Turnham Green, outside London, in London, St. Giles's Church, those are all in that passage, or some of them are in that passage. So we can see that having re read through, I can see Turnham Green, I can see London, um, I can see St. Giles's. And what we need you to do is to have a really close look and see what actually are we talking about? All of those words are there, or many of those words are there, but actually, in terms of the answer, the answer is hiding in the text. So you've got to really go through and see if you can find that answer. So 
Yes, every word is there, but does it answer the question? Remember, the question is, where did most of the robberies occur? So we're looking for somewhere where it says that there's lots of robberies. And you want to go to each of those words and see, does that say where there's lots of robberies? So if you think you've got an answer, again, if you can put your answer down for me, and then I can see. Perfect. So we started to get an answers three. Okay, so some of you are a little bit unsure on this one. We've got quite a lot of different answers on this. That's because the answer is really hiding. We have to go through it fairly closely. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back to the text. I'm going to show you exactly where I'll be looking. So if we go through each answer, some of you guys said A, some of you guys said C, some of you guys said D. No one said B, as far as I can see. Um, and that's because we are talking about London. It does say at the start that we're, we're talking about London. Now, Turnham Green, St. Giles's Church and in London. So if I go back and I find out where each of those words are mentioned, I'm not just looking for the word. The fact that the word is in the text is not telling me that that is the answer. What I need to do is find the word and see what's around it. See what is around that answer. Is it talking about one incident? Is it talking about many incidents? Okay, so if I go back to the text, I have got, so if I take turn and green, which is A, first of all, it tells me that the Lord Mayor, was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman. One mayor, one highwayman. It doesn't tell me that there's lots of robberies. It just tells me that one of them happened in Turnham Green. So A, which says in Turnham Green, is probably not where most of the robberies occurred. And it's really careful to look at the exact wording of this because A, which says in Turnham Green, is only about one robbery. It's not about most of the robberies. It's only about one of them. So here, the one robbery that we're talking about in Turnham Green is of the Lord Mayor of London. So he's only one person. So we can't have Turnham Green. The next one that we had down there is in London. So C, which was in London, because none of you thought it was B. And where does it talk about London? Well, it's a little bit harder to find London in the text. The word London appears where it says Lord Mayor of London, but that's not what we're looking for. The bit of evidence that is in the text that we need to find is right at the start. So in England, there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night. So they are telling us that there are burglaries and robberies taking place in the capital, the capital being London, every night. So that would be the one that we're looking at. And I can see that some of you are changing your answers. You're learning from this to understand, okay, right, it says about the capital, it doesn't say London. So it's made it trickier for us to find it. But by reading it very, very closely, we can see that it does say Lots of burglaries and robberies took place in the capital every night. Now, the other one that some of you said was D, which would have been in St. Giles's church. And again, if I look at the D here, we can see that it appears in the text, just the same as Turnham Green does. And it tells us that musketeers went into St. Giles to search for contraband goods, which again, is one or two maybe events. It's not talking about all of the robberies. In fact, we can tell that the mayor of London had a robbery happen elsewhere in Turnham Green. 
So it's not just in St. Giles's, wherever St. Giles's is, it is likely to be in the capital itself every night. So lots of you who are saying C. For our next question, this is the one that I had to consult with a friend for, another tutor actually. And uh, I actually, I rang her up and I said, I think I've got the answer, but I want to see. So we're now answering number three. So I'd like you to move on to number three for me. All right, so where is number three in terms of the writer's use of semicolons in this paragraph? So what is the effect of the writer's use of semicolons in this paragraph? Is it to make the narrator seem out of breath for effect? Is it to ensure that the sentences do not get too long? Is it to build up long descriptive sentences for effect? Or is it to show that each sentence follows on from the last? So the whole of this first paragraph has lots of semicolons. So if we go back to it and I take a look through it, I'll move back, I'll read through. I can point out our semicolons so we've got daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night, semicolon. Families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town without removing their furniture to upholsterers' warehouses for security, semicolon. The highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the night, in the light, semicolon. There's lots of semicolons. So why do we think that they are there? Okay, so our options are to make the narrator feel out of breath and make the narrator seem out of breath for effect, to ensure that sentences do not get too long, to build up long descriptive sentences for effect, or to show that each sentence follows on from the last. So I think some of you have started to answer. Let's have a look. Let's see how we are doing. So if you think you've got an answer, pop that down for me. So when you're not sure between two, what we would do in that point is if you're not sure between two, piece of exam technique, you're going to need to pick one, but ring the question so you can go back to it. So ring it, write down that you thought it was C or B, but pick one in case you run out of time, because if you run out of time, you need to have an answer there. So if you think it's between C and B, I can see someone said C or B. So make sure that you pick which one you think it is the most likely, but ring the question so that you could go back to it. Okay. So lots of you who are participating, it's really great to see your answers appear. So lots of you are saying it's C. And this is, this is C, and the answer is C, to build up those long descriptive sentences for effect. Now, the reason that I ended up consulting my tutor friend was actually lots of these aren't sentences. So we started to have this moment where we thought, mm, are they clauses? Are they not clauses? Are they joined clauses? Is it that the, the question is trying to get the fact that there's not sentences? But then we thought we'd probably overanalyzed it. So yes, they do make you get out of breath when you're reading it. But that's not the effect that we're looking for because the narrator's not running, the narrator's not excited, there's no reason for the narrator to be out of breath. So to make the narrator seem out of breath, it doesn't fit with the rest of the text. It's definitely not to ensure the sentences get too long because they're each very different. So we can't say, oh, you know, it's a long thing that's been long, different clauses that have been split up by semicolons because they're not all the same. They're all different events. So it's not about the sentences being too long. And to show that each sentence follows on from the last, that doesn't make sense either. So I'm eliminating lots of my options. I'd eliminate why the sentence follows on from the last because when I eliminate it, those sentences, they are not dependent on each other. I can see that if I go back to the text, I can see that the fact that the highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light is not related to the fact that families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town. They're not the same sentence. So I can't say that it's about following on 
There's no first this happened, second this happened, third this happened. It's not telling me it in order, so it can't be D. Perfect. So if we move on to number four, what do we understand by the phrase? So on to number four, the highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light. So what do we think that might mean? Does it mean highwaymen do the same work as city traders? Does it mean that city tradesmen have turned out the lights for highwaymen? Does it mean that the city tradesmen have to work two jobs to survive? Or a city tradesman might rob people at night. So again, I'll take you back to the text. I'm always looking back to the text. I'm not guessing it. There's no point I will ever guess it. I will always read back on the text and see where does that piece sit? Where does it tell me a highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the night? Here it is. Okay, so in the middle of that first paragraph. So after security, the highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the night. In the light. The mail was waylaid by seven robbers. So it's its own clause, it's its own part. What does it mean? The highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light. Okay, so some of you are saying C or D, you're not quite sure between C or D. So we need to consider the whole of this sentence or the whole of this paragraph when we're considering between C or D. Some of you thinking maybe maybe it's a couple of one of one or two of you that say A, but but quite a lot of you between C or D. So if we're looking between C or D, we're looking at does it say anywhere that city tradesmen might have to work two jobs? Does it say that a city tradesman might rob someone at night? So I'm looking back in the text to see, can I find additional, additional evidence? Is there something else going on that might prove, might help me to understand? And I think there is. So if I go back into that paragraph, it's not exactly on that sentence, but it does tell me that there's lots and lots of people going around. It seems quite chaotic. There's highwaymen in the dark. There's the uh, musketeers. There is highwaymen all over the place and there's daring burglaries and highway robberies. And the fact that it's very daring and there seems like there's a lot of chaos going on, it makes me think that there's maybe one of those answers that's a bit more, um, more formable than the others. So if they were saying to me that the city tradesmen would have to work, and it says here, have to work two jobs to survive, then I'd expect to be getting something else in the text, something else in the paragraph that explains that city tradesmen didn't earn any money or that said that city tradesmen were struggling to get by. And I can't find any evidence in there that backs that up. Now, if there's any evidence to say that the city tradesmen might rob people at night, it would be about saying that we're not sure who anybody is. and We're not sure um, if it's if they are reputable. So if they are someone we can trust or if they are not. And in here, there is bits that talk about the fact that we don't know who everybody is. It says that it's a lawless time. It says that the burglaries were daring. It tells us later on about a highwayman and about the way that people didn't trust each other. It says here, in those days, travelers were very shy of being confidential on short notice for anybody in the road might be a robber or a league in league with robbers. They suspected everybody. So the fact that they suspected each other tells me that actually it might be that, yes, by day they were, they were respectable, they worked in the city, but at night they might be lawless. And that suggests to me that the answer is D, that a city tradesman might rob people at night. So yes, there might be an answer to say that, that the city tradesman had to work two jobs, but I can't find any other evidence of it in the text. 
And I can find evidence that we don't know who these robbers are. And that means that they might be city tradesmen. So that's why I choose to go for D, because I'm not sure, but the rest of the text has given me the um, it's given me the, the clues that I need elsewhere. And those clues are actually in the second part of the text saying that anyone on the road might be a robber or in league with robbers. So therefore, we would say it would be D. All right. So next question that we're going to have a look at. What happens to the mail? Now this, you have to be really careful about your ordering because a lot of this is very similar. We've got a bloody shootout occurs after which no one resists further robberies. A bloody shootout occurs after which no one dares rob the mail. A bloody shootout occurs after which peace is restored. And a bloody shootout occurs after which a peaceful silence ensues. Now, what I do is I will go back, I'll go back to that paragraph, and I will find that piece and I will draw out just a bit drawing about what happens. So it's up here in the first paragraph. And it's just here where it says, the mail was waylaid by seven robbers and the guard shot three dead and then got sh shot dead himself by the other four. After which the mail was robbed in peace. So one of those, if you draw out what happens, should give you the answer. So the guard shot three dead, then got shot dead himself by the other four, after which the mail was robbed in peace. Let's have a read through that and think about what they are talking about. So we know that there's this bloody shootout. That's the same for every single one of those questions. We don't focus on that part, but we do need to focus on what happened afterwards. So the options we've got after which no one resists further robberies, after which no one dares rob the mail, after which peace is restored, after which a peaceful silence ensues. So have we got no one robbing the mail? Have we got people robbing the mail? Have we got a peaceful silence? Have we got peace? So what have we got? What is actually happening there in that bit which says, after which the mail was robbed in peace? So after which the rob mail was robbed in peace. What does that mean? After which the mail was robbed in peace. So lots of you are picking up on the fact that peace is mentioned, but the rest of the words, not so much. So if I could eat my dinner in peace, what's that allowing me to do? Think about that. Because here it's saying that the mail was robbed in peace. So if I am allowed to eat my dinner in peace, that means that no one is disturbing me, but I am eating my dinner. And here we're talking about the mail is robbed in peace. So after which the mail was robbed in peace. So lots and lots of you saying that you can see the peace part. But what about the bit before where it says that the mail was robbed in peace? So there was a shootout and then something happened. The mail was robbed in peace. So let's say I have an argument with my parents and then I say, oh, just leave me in peace. And they left me to read in peace. That means that I got to do the activity. Here, the mail was robbed in peace. So think about what that means. There's a couple of you that are getting there, but not, not all of you. So think about what it means when we say that the mail was robbed in peace. So we've got options are no one resists the further robberies. No one dares to rob the mail. Peace is restored. 
a peaceful silence ensues. It's a tricky one. It really is a tricky one, this one. I'll give you a couple of minutes to pop your answers down and I'll talk you through it. Location is all the same. The bits are the same, but we're not sure on what the end is. Now, the other thing that I sometimes look at is to look at which of those maybe are exactly the same. And I think there's two in there that really are the same. It means it can't be either of them because if they're both the same, then they can't be the, they can't be the answer. So let me talk you through it. Some of you are a little bit confused on this one. It is a tricky one. That's why we're giving you these tricky questions. To really stretch your knowledge. Okay. So we know that there is a shootout. That's fine. That's the same for every single one. But the bits that we are struggling with is the after which the male was robbed in peace. Okay. When we're talking about the male, we're talking about whether the male is being robbed still, not robbed or whether there is just peace. So after which the rail, male was robbed in peace. Well, if I get rid of after which, and I just took the male was robbed in peace, then I am saying that the male is continuing to be robbed. So it still says the male was robbed. It doesn't say the male was left alone. It doesn't say the male was not robbed. It doesn't say that the male robbers stopped it tells me that the male was continuing to be robbed. Now, that in peace part is suggesting to me if the male was robbed in peace, no one else is going to get in the way of the robbers. And that makes sense because the last person who got in the way of the robbers, the guard, he ended up dying. So no one else is going to stand in the way of the robbers. The male is robbed. So the male is robbed. That, that tells us that someone's going to come in and steal the male. In peace, no one's getting in the way of the robbers. Now, the bit where everybody got confused was about whether peace is restored or peace is happening. Now, peace is restored and a peaceful silence ensues are both similar. In fact, they're too similar because they're both the same answer. And so it can't be C and it can't be D because Yes, the word peace is there, but it's clear from the paragraph that actually it didn't stop the robbings because then the Lord Mayor of London is being robbed. Thieves are snipping diamond crosses from the necks of lords. So it's not about it stopping. The word peace, there is a red herring. It's there to confuse you and to get you to think, oh, it says peace in my answer. It's not the one that we're going for. So we're looking at just that little piece, the idea that says the male was robbed. It doesn't say the male wasn't robbed. So we're between A and B. No one dares to rob the male. That would say that the robbing of the male stopped. So we are talking that it is A, five is A, that nobody resists the robberies because the robbers are left in peace. The robbers are left well alone. Nobody wants to get in the way of the robbers. They're going to leave them in peace. Like people leave me in peace when I eat my dinner because I don't like people talking to me when I eat my dinner. So they might leave me in peace. And that's what they're saying here for the robbers. So we're looking at no one resists further robberies because the male was robbed in peace. They're allowed to get on with it. Okay. So we're going to do a couple more questions so that you guys can see and have a chance to, to have a go at all of these different styles of question. In fact, actually, this is really useful. There's, there's uh, quite a lot of you online, so it's really, really good to see what everybody thinks. So our number six is what are we told regarding the mayor of London? So we've got that the mayor shows a great deal of potential delivering a speech on Turnham Green. The mayor is forced to deliver mail because there are no postmen on Turnham, to Turnham Green. 
The mayor is robbed on Turnham Green and humiliated in front of his followers. The mayor is robbed on Turnham Green and delivers a speech showing his potential to his followers. So, again, we've got all of the same location. It still says Turnham Green, Turnham Green, Turnham Green. That gives us a clue and it tells us where we're going in the paragraph. So we know that the bit that we're looking at is talking about the mayor and Turnham Green. So if I have a quick read through, I've got some really tricky words. Now, when I come across tricky words, I kind of block them out. And I don't normally have to worry about what they are because I can work around them. So I've got that magnificent something, the Lord Mayor of London, was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman who, now I might be able to work out the next word, D, spoiled him in sight of all his something. So I can start to eliminate using those words. I know certain things about the Lord Mayor. I know that it's at Turnham Green. I can start to consider, is there anywhere that he says about speech? Is there anywhere that he says about being robbed? Is there anywhere that it says about him um, having to deliver the mail. So have a look at that sentence and really think, okay, is it about the mail? Is it about being robbed? Is it about making a speech? Is there anything in that sentence that I've just read aloud about speaking, about being robbed, about being delivering mail? So if I go back to the text again, the mayor of London was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman who somethinged him of all of his somethings, in sight of all of his somethings, sorry. Okay. So is there anything in there that talks about speaking? Is there in anything in there that talks about um, being robbed? Is there anything in there that talks about delivering mail? Good. And lots of you, lots of you are getting there with your options. That's perfect. Brilliant. It's great to see all of your answers coming through. Perfect. All right. Lots of you saying that it is C. You are correct. So C is our answer. Good. Well done. Because it does say that he was robbed. Now, even if I didn't know what this word up here, which says retinue, it doesn't necessarily matter because I can see that he was made to stand and deliver by a highwayman. I can see that he was robbed. So I can get rid of number one, A. I can get rid of B because they don't say anything about robbed. And then between C and D, can I see anywhere that it says that he delivered a speech? Well, no, I can't see anything about a speech in there. So instead, I've got to go for the fact that it's in front of his followers. And we can see that in front of his followers, we can see in sight of. So those two phrases match in front of, in sight of. Those things are probably the same. Even if I do not know the word, I can still work out the answer. It's a process of elimination. It's a process of focusing in on the phrasing and the words. So it doesn't say exactly, it doesn't say he delivered a speech. So therefore, I can't say that the answer is to do with a speech. It's not to do with a speech. It has to be C. It has to be that he was humiliated in front of his followers. Perfect. So let's keep going on to number seven. So what do we understand by the phrase, nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way? And this is at the end of the first paragraph. So at the end of the first paragraph, it says, nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. So again, we're going to want to use the context. What's happened in the first paragraph? And why might nobody think any of these occurrences much out of the common way? So if we go back, we go back to where our speech is. It's right at the bottom. And the mob fired on the musketeers and the musketeers fired on the mob. I always go back. I always go back a little bit to see what I'm talking about. And nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. 
So they've busy, they've described in the paragraph all of these different robberies that are happening. And then at the end, they say, nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. So now I can start to look at the answers. Now I can start to see, okay, what is it that I might be able to consider? Is it that common people didn't think much of these events, that they didn't go out of their way to consider these incidents, that people thought these events were not common, or people thought these incidents were common? Now, the word common is in every single answer. So we have to go back to the text, and we've got to consider what's it talking about common. Now, it doesn't say common people, it says common way. Nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. So I think I can probably eliminate some. But I want to know, what is your answer? What do you think? Someone started putting their answers down. Oh, it's exciting. I like seeing all of your answers. Okay, so some of you aren't sure. That's okay. So we've got nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. Thinking about nobody and thinking about the common way. Okay, so some of you giving guesses. Perfect. Okay, not many of you are getting tricked by the fact that the common's in every single answer. So we want to think about the fact that the whole paragraph is all about all of these robberies that are happening and that they're going and they're going and they're going. And we've got loads and loads of different robberies and they're happening all over the capital. We've seen that they're happening in London, they're happening in the capital. And then use that to consider hmm, what might that mean? OK, so the majority of you are getting the correct answer. And it is that people thought that these events were common. Nobody thought that these were out of the common way. Now, the reason that I wouldn't go for A or B, because it says nobody. It doesn't say anything about common people. It says no one, no one whatsoever, not only common people. So it only says that nobody. So we're talking everyone here. Nobody, everyone. Nobody thought these much out of the common way. So I can get rid of A and I can get rid of B. And then I need to use a bit of logic. So people thought these events were not common. People thought these incidents were common. Well, they've described to me in the paragraph all the way at the start that there were loads and loads of highwaymen, robbers, musketeers. There's lots of different stories. So it makes sense that they would be these ones are the ones that would be uh, common because there's lots of them. So the fact that nobody thought these occurrences much out of the common way, it's telling me that no one, no people, thought that these events were uncommon. So it's a bit of a double negative, really. So uh, it's all about pulling out those key words. So people thought that these incidents were common. No one thought that they were out of the ordinary. And that is another technique that we'd use, another technique that we teach. If you don't know what out of the common way might mean, let's think of a similar phrasing out of the ordinary. It happens a lot of times, exactly. It happens a lot of times. Nobody thought it was out of the ordinary. So if we can think of that similar phrasing, and we can think, okay, nobody thought that these occurrences were out of the ordinary, okay. People knew that those incidents were common. Okay. We're going to move on to number eight. And actually, what I'm going to end up doing, because we've we're taking almost an hour at this point, we're probably going to go up to maybe number 10 to talk through each of these. And what I'll do is I'll pop the, um, the PowerPoint with all the rest of the answers up so that you guys can have a chance to have a read through the questions and do it yourselves as well. Okay. So we'll keep going. We'll do another couple of questions. And then, uh, and then at the end, I'll put all of the rest of them up. So number eight, we're just moving on to paragraph two. We've read paragraph one in a lot of detail. And we've discussed it in a lot of detail. 
because a lot of these skills are the same no matter what the comprehension is. So what is the effect of the opening sentence of paragraph two? Now, I can see here there is a, there's a sentence that's underlined. It was the Dover Road that lay on a Friday night late in November before the first of the persons with whom this history has business. Again, quite a lot of tricky sentences, tricky vernacular, tricky ways of, of writing. But what we need to do is we need to pull out the important parts. So it's talking about the Dover Road on a Friday late in November, and that's the story that we're going to go to before the first persons with whom this history has business. So is it to move the story on from London to Dover? Is it to move the story on from to specific events, to give a sense of the history behind the narrative, or to introduce the history of the male business? Now, if you've managed to read on, you might be able to guess what that sentence is really for. So consider which one of these is correct. And then I'm going to point out some bits where they maybe they're trying to lead you astray. They're trying to introduce maybe a red herring. So give me what you think and let me know what your answer is. And then I'll talk you through it. So what do you think your answer might be? Of course. So we've got the opening of the sentence on paragraph two. So we've got to move the story on from London to Dover, to move the story on to specific events, to give a sense of the history behind the narrative, to introduce the history of the mail business. And the sentence that we're looking at is here. It was the Dover Road that lay on a Friday night late in November, before the first of this persons with whom this history has business. So what are we looking at in terms of our answer? And you might get a bit of a better sense of it if you read the rest of the paragraph, because it will tell us whether we're going to move on to a history paragraph or whether we're going to move on to a specific event, or whether we've moved to being in Dover, it will tell us a little bit more about it. So if you read the rest of the paragraph from here, the Dover Road lay as to him beyond the Dover Mail as it lumbered up Shooter's Hill. He walked up the hill in the mire by the side of the mail, as the rest of the passengers did, not because they had the least relish for walking exercise under the circumstances, but because the hill and the harness and the mud and the mail were all so heavy that the horses had three times already come to a stop. So do you think that that gives us history? Does that tell us history? Is it tell us the history of the male business? Does it give us history behind the narrative? Or is there something else that's happening there? So is that text that's going on for the second paragraph, is that about history? Is it telling us history? Or is it doing something else? Someone's saying here, it doesn't give us the history behind the narrative. It doesn't give us a lot of historical facts. It doesn't tell us about the history of the male business. So what might our answer be? If it's not telling us history again they are throwing in some red herrings because they're throwing in the word history there and it's there so that you might go oh it says history in the mark i'm going to choose that one because it says history they need you to read past it so if we get rid of that last piece it was the dover road that lay on a friday night late in november before the first of the people that we're going to tell this story about so it's not about history, it's doing something else. As you say, it's doing something else. Okay. So none of you have said A, none of you have fallen into the first trap. 
So the first point, the first red herring they've put in there is they've said London to Dover. Yes, it talks about Dover Road, but it does not mention that we're in Dover. They're hoping that you see the word Dover Road and that you think, oh, Dover, that's what it says. But that's not what they're talking about. So you've not fallen into the first trap. Now, the other one was the fact that they say history in it. But actually, the rest of the paragraph, and they've said, what's the effect of the opening sentence of paragraph two? So why is there that sentence? Well, it's not to introduce the mail, because there's nothing about the history of the mail there. So we know that we can get rid of A, we can get rid of D. Then we're moving on to, is it B, is it C? So is it giving us a sense of the history behind the narrative? One of you has said, no, it's not giving us a sense of any history. It doesn't explain who this person is. In fact, it doesn't ever tell us his name. So it doesn't tell us who the narrator is. It doesn't tell us any history of his. In fact, that's the first paragraph. The first paragraph has explained maybe why we're here. This is to move the story on to specific events. So well done. If you put B, because that's a tricky question, it is to move that story on. So it's saying, here we are. We've talked about everything that's going on in London, but now, and it tells us we're on the Dover Road location on a Friday night time, late in November, date. So it's telling us all the specifics to lead us on to that specific event. Specifics give us that specific event. So I have been told location, I've been told time, I have been told month. I can now picture exactly where I am. That is my specific event. So I have moved from all of the explanation of robbery in London to this one event. And that is why it's been. Okay. We've got two more questions before we're going to finish because I'm aware that I'm running over time. And this number nine is all about the word lumbered. Now, I've got a little trick for this. For lumbered, I like to just see, can I put each of these words into the, into the sentence where lumbered is? So which one is the best synonym for lumbered? Well, let's have a look. Let's see if I can put climbed, burdened, plodded, or loaded into the place where lumbered is. So up here. The Dover Road lay to him beyond the Dover Mail as it lumbered up Shooter's Hill, as it climbed up Shooter's Hill, as it, what's the other one? As it burdened up Shooter's Hill, as it plodded up Shooter's Hill, as it loaded up Shooter's Hill. So miss out that word, put in the others and see, hmm, what are we talking about what are we continuing with what are we we what word could i replace lumbered with some of you might know the word lumbered some of you might be aware of it but some of you might not so if you're really struggling with a word miss it out and put in a new word see what that new word might be so i want you to give it a guess is it climbed burdened plodded and loaded now there's a second a second little tip which is to read on, because I think two of those words could replace lumbered, but one of them is better than the other. And that is coming from the fact that we need to read on. So here it tells us that they're walking, the people are walking up the hill, the male is lumbering up Shooter's Hill, but they are walking because the hill, the harness, the mud and the male were all so heavy that the horses had already come to a stop. So lots of you are saying A, which is one of the words that will fit there, but I think there's a better word that will fit. Now, I agree that climbed will work because we're talking about a hill, so we're climbing up the hill. But the fact that everything is so heavy, the horses already are trying to drag it up the hill. Three times they've already come to a stop. There is another word in there that might explain it a little bit more clearly. So climbed would replace it, but it's not the best word to replace. So the options that we have, remember it's best synonym. Climbed, burden, plodded, loaded. 
So lots of you immediately said climbed, but there's, I think, a better word there. Perfect. And lots of you are saying that you think it's plodded. And I agree, plodded is a much better fit. You have to be careful sometimes because that asks for the best synonym, not the only synonym. Two synonyms work, climbed and plodded work. But climbed suggests that it could be easy. I climbed up the stairs. Plodded tells me that it is a heavy kind of walk. And we know that because it says further down that the hill, the harness, the mud and the mail were all so heavy. So we can see that the word should be plodded. Okay. Number 10. And unfortunately, I've got to stop at number 10 because I've got to go and teach another lesson. But what I'll do, as I said, I'll pop the presentation and then maybe I'll do a recording so that you guys can see my explanations. And I'll pop that in there for you as well. So you get both parts of it. Hopefully you found it useful so you've been able to see all the different techniques that you can use. So the last question that we're looking at, before I tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do, is uh, the word in the second or third paragraph that emphasizes how muddy the road is. So with this one, we've got to go and find each of these words, reek, mire, tremulous, clammy, and we've got to try and see which one fits muddy the best. Again, we're always looking at best fit. So if I go back and I try and find, first of all, reek. Where is reek? I'm scanning it. I'm scanning it to try and see. Now, if I've read this beforehand, I should have an idea about where it is. I know it's between the first and the second paragraph. Here it is. It's underlined. It's in the bottom of the third paragraph. It says, the reek of the labouring horses steamed into it. Well, I don't understand what that sentence means, so I'm going back. I'm going to make it from this short, para short phrase to a whole sentence, and that might help me with the word reek. So it says, it was dense enough to shut out everything from the light of the coach lamps, but, those of its, but these of its own workings, and a few yards of road, and the reek of the labouring horses streamed into it, as if they had made it all. So it doesn't sound like I'm talking about muddy there. It sounds like I'm talking about something that is dense and something that is really hard to see in, which isn't really mud because I don't know why I'd be trying to see through mud. So reek doesn't sound like it's going to fit. Maya. Let's find the word Maya. Okay, he walked up the hill in the mire by the side of the mail as the rest of the passengers did, not because they had the least relish for walking exercise under the circumstance, but because the hill, the harness, the mud and the mail were all so heavy that the horses had already three times, had three times already come to a stop. Okay, so that mentions mud, at least it says about mud in the sentence. So I could be talking about mud when I'm looking at walking up the hill in the mire. So that's a maybe for me. I go to the next word. So the next word is tremulous. Okay, so tremulous is down at the bottom of the second paragraph. With drooping heads and tremulous tails, they mashed their way through the thick mud, floundering and stumbling all between whiles as if they were falling to pieces at the larger joints. OK, so again, I've got mud in this sentence, so I may be talking about it. I'm talking about drooping heads and tremulous tails. So it might be the tremulous. I could think about being muddy. But again, would I be talking about muddy tails with drooping heads? I feel like I might not be, but I don't know. So I'm going to put it down as a maybe. And then the next word, clammy. Clammy is my next word. And if I go back and I find clammy, a clammy and intensely cold mist. Okay, I can't have a muddy mist. Muddy mist doesn't work. So I know clammy is out. So the two that I'm looking for is C or B. And I need to work out which one of those is telling me most about the mud. Now, I can go back to the question because lots of you 
have started to make your guess, but you've not reread the question. Which word in the second or third paragraph emphasizes how muddy the road is? So we're not just talking about the word mud. We're talking about the muddy road. Now, if I go back to where it says tremulous, I'm talking about tails. I'm talking about drooping heads of the horses and the tremulous tails of the horses. I'm not necessarily talking about the road. If I go back to the mire, he walked up the hill and the mire by the side of the mail as the rest of the passengers did. So they are walking up. They're walking up a road. And they're walking up the road because it is so muddy. Here, which is with the tremulous tails, we're talking about the fact that the horses are working really hard to get through the mud, but it doesn't tell us about the mud. Maya, and Maya is like a bog. So Maya tells us about the muddy road. Tremulous means to shake or to tremble. If you think about a similar word, you think about tremor, tremble, tremulous, makes me think of shaking. It's not really to do with muddy. Yes, they're walking hard because of the mud, but that's not explaining mud. Maya is talking to me about mud. Okay. So as I said, I will put all of these questions up along with the text. I'll pop them up so that you can read through them. And we've got a, another, para, another load of questions as well. So we'll do a quick video on those as well. But we're coming to the end of the lesson. And uh, I just wanted to, to kind of wrap up and uh, to, to tell you guys a little bit about what we do. So um, thank you for tuning in because it's been really, really great to, to do this. And uh, I really appreciate uh, everybody ch turning in, tuning in and turning up because it's really lovely to see you guys all learn. Um, if you are looking uh, to, to do more of this, you're looking to really improve those comprehension skills, I wanted to point out that my company is running a comprehension course next week, uh, so do feel free to check that out. Um, I also wanted to say a really big thank you to, to Deep and the rest of the team uh, who let me come on and do these, do these for you. And, and I really hope that you have got a lot of information out of it and how to tackle really tricky comprehensions. These are very tricky ones. So um, I just wanted to say thanks for the for private and grammar school information group team, um, because we are a whole team. We do all work here. Um, we all kind of volunteer our time to, to help you guys out. And, um, and one of the things that we like to do is come on and do lives like this. So I really hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do ask them. Ask them either in the, the comments or, or drop me a message. Absolutely fine. Um, and I will get all the rest of the questions up for you. And I'll do a quick little video as well um, just to continue. So thank you so much for tuning in. And you've been really, really great. Um, I really, really have loved uh, working with you all today. Thanks so much for joining me. All right, then. Okay. Thanks, then. Bye-bye.